Lee lists Shannon as the Shannon Estate at the mansion, the gate house, coach house, and perimeter wall. Since there was no compensation in 1974, the estate of Shannon was listed as a heritage resource to be included later on the heritage inventory, precursor to the register. When it was evaluated for the register in the 80s, it scored a perfect 100. Personally, I haven't seen a, any building or site rated over 85 in the last 10 years of serving on the Vancouver Heritage Commission. The original description showed the concern of the council of the day prompted by the outraged neighbors that it was all about the estate that deserved heritage respect. Shannon is, in reality, a piece of First Shaughnessy that slipped down Granville to 57th and matched it completely in character, as developed at the same time, mainly pre-World War I. If one goes through the First Shaughnessy district guidelines, each and every guideline is met by Shannon. The need for and sense of enclosure, the importance of park lake landscaping, the neighborly lack of overview, the privacy of the first floor behind hedges with the roof line being a prominent feature, the attention to authenticity in every detail, materials, design, and execution. Shannon is a celebration of the extraordinary talents and craftsmanship of all the men and women who brought it into being, the architects, carpenters, draftsmen, gardeners, masons, tile setters, and all the other trades. The Heritage Commission was given a tour in the summer of 2009 around the site. No information was forthcoming about the extent of what was being proposed, and comments were solicited for the statement of significance. Not all comments were incorporated into the statement, which is a snapshot in time of the existing site and buildings. The most important statement was the site, as envisioned by Arthur Erickson's team, was composed of a castle village hierarchy. The mansion is the castle, the roll houses plus the gatehouse and coach house are the equivalent of the outbuildings that would surround a castle inside the walls. This is the most compelling description of the massing of the site and should be the leading character defining element in the statement of significance and part of the guiding principles that council puts forward. Given that from the beginning of the city's involvement with Shannon, where the perimeter wall and trees define the estate, Heritage Vancouver has several questions. Why is the wall being opened on the south to establish an unwanted public park, given that the Parks Board hardly needs to be saddled with extra costs when our boulevards and yard parks can't be maintained. Another question is the level of stewardship. Extra density is being rewarded or ex, uh, being accounted for because the heritage buildings, the mansion, gatehouse, coach house, and the perimeter wall are being restored. Since when did we start to reward what's clearly demolition by neglect? This is not restoration, this is deferred maintenance. <laughs> by this developer for over 30, 40 years. The Vancouver Commission voted unanimously to have the wall restored, not being privy to the negotiations. Are these heritage restorations being counted as of value? If the applicant comes back in 25 years asking for heritage bonuses, having already received the right to infill this heritage estate back in 1974, isn't there the possibility of double dipping, given the fact that the applicant will still be landlord for half the site, which will remain rental? In a larger sense, why is this project, in comparison to the Arbutus Shopping Centre, which has the commercial retail amenities that this site lacks, proceeding with such unseemly haste? In discussing these questions and others such as the lack of commercial retail amenities nearby Shannon, the failure to address the predictable traffic problems, and the lack of transport, the fact that the number of units will be almost three quarters of much more urban Olympic Village, it's easy to overlook the big picture. I started to research major historic uh, states in other metropolitan areas and found the following. In Portland, Oregon, the Pittock Mansion overlooking downtown Portland is situated on 40 acres of spectacular view property and there is no development encroaching on the estate. In Seattle, Bloedel Estate sits on 536 acres including waterfront with no encroaching development on the estate. In Esquimalt, Hadley Park, now the home of Royal Rose University, sits on valuable waterfront including 565 acres, and apart from the 50s era dormitory at substantial distance has no encroaching development. In Victoria, Craig Derrick Castle, although stripped of its original 27 acres, sits on top Rockland Hill with its existing granite perimeter walls surrounded at a distance by two and a half story houses, and an excellent illustration of a castle village massing that respects a heritage estate. Again, this castle village hierarchy seen at Shannon satisfied the council in 1974. At Craig Dare Castle, there is no encroaching development. In Calgary, the Lohe Mansion with the Billiard Garden sits on an unencumbered site of 2.8 acres in the downtown area with no encroaching development. In Toronto, Castle Loma. Running over your time, just you could wrap up. Uh, I'll try my best. 
and well, drug. No, it's there are literally okay. many, dozens and dozens of people waiting. Uh, need more time two more cities, time. two more cities. In Toronto, Castle Loma dominates Toronto from its hillside estate with five acres of gardens and with no encroaching development on site or nearby. And in that world class city, New York, the mayor's house, Gracie Mansion, bordering the East River's valuable waterfront, is situated on 11 acres of parkland with no encroaching development. So, how does the city that aspires to be world class tolerate this application, which abuses our largest heritage estate this way?